Hi everyone, this is Commissioner Winston Barnes in the city of Miramar in the southwest corner of Broward County in the state of Florida. Welcome you all to our every now and again discussion. This time we're talking about stroke awareness, May being the stroke awareness month that is observed across this country. It is of, of major significance, especially when one looks at the demographics of the city of Miramar, especially in the historic section. What we've been able to do is to grab two very, very busy people to come and talk with us. And what I'd like to do as we start is have them introduce themselves. Um, we'll have ladies first, Carol Hilton. Talk a little good bit about yourself. Before. Good evening, um, Winston. My name is Carol Hilton. I am the president and founder of Smiley's Voice Foundation. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. As a matter of fact, we're the only stroke awareness foundation in South Florida. This organization was founded in 2010 after my husband and I lost our son, Michael Hilton Jr., known to many as DJ Smiley. Uh, he passed away from a stroke in November of 2009. At that time, many people thought that was a young that was an old people's disease. So hence, we decided to form that foundation to spread the awareness of stroke, its impact, prevention, and treatment for community. So I'll have Dr. Ajiboye introduce himself as well. Can't hear you. You muted. Yeah, we might as well share with our viewers that Dr. Ajiboye is very busy. He's actually on shift. And what we're hoping to do is to grab him from time to time during this, this presentation and he can share with us. But but Carl, let's let's start until he's of I mean, listen, this okay. doesn't have to be this doesn't have to be formal and that structured. Let's let's grab him when we can. Um, I think we're Hello. fortunate to, to have him sharing with us. That sounds uh, like him. Dr. Yes. Aguiboye? Yes. Okay, Doc, why, why don't you, um, if you can, put us on camera and tell our listeners a little bit about your background. Okay. Um, in the ER, right? So I'll just, can you guys see me? Not yet. Okay. So I'm Dr. Ajiboye. I'm a neuroendovascular yeah. surgeon, currently busy working here at Memorial, uh, guarded for an emergency case. Uh, I did my training at Thomas Jefferson and also at the Stroke Institute in Dallas. And what I do is I take care of people of all age group, as young as age two, all the way to age 104. I did a back to me uh, three months ago and a one around four year old lady that's very, very functional. So I help manage patients with uh, stroke, uh, usually the interventional part when they have clots in the brain. And I also help um, manage patients with aneurysms, see if they have abnormal blood vessels uh, in the brain. Uh, and that's one thing I enjoy doing, uh, doing the best to also educate the community about the risk factors, the ones that are modifiable and the ones that are not modifiable. We'll certainly go through that today. Uh, and uh, in addition to educating the community, also we, I, I enjoy educating the EMS crew, uh, the folks that get them to us, and we let them know what signs and symptoms to look out for. Because one thing that's key with regards to stroke is that time is brain. The quicker you can get to us, that could mean the difference between recovery, disability, and possibly death. So uh, this is something I enjoy doing, and I look forward to talking to you. And thanks, Commissioner Barnes and uh, Carol Hilton for inviting me. And I uh, look forward to talking to the community of Miramar. Okay, thank you so much. No problem. Okay, let's, 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 Carol, let's hold on to him as long as we can. Absolutely, <laughs> we, go right ahead. Before, before a patient grabs him. Okay, yes. we talk about time. Tell us why time is so important when a, um, there's a suspected case of stroke. Okay, so I'm just going to sit down here. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we so can. The, the thing with stroke is uh, just think of the uh, think of the vessels in the body as uh, channels. You know, the heart pumps blood to the brain, 
And the brain is one, I mean, all the organs are important, but the brain is one of the most important. And the reason is that controls a lot of function in terms of your thinking ability. It controls a lot of all the other parts of the body as well. And what does the brain need in order to function properly? It needs the nutrients, it needs the oxygen. And that's something that the blood vessels cut up to the brain. So if you have a stroke, broadly speaking, there are two types of stroke. There's the hemorrhagic in which there's a rupture of a blood vessel. That's only about 15%. And then there's the ischemic, which is when there's a blockade in the blood vessel supplying blood to the brain. So think of a pipe carrying water. If that water, if there's a blockade or there's a lot of rust or there's a lot of plaque within that blood vessel That's or cool. within that pipe, then there's not w good water getting distally into where they're supposed to go. So what happens is when you have a blockade in the blood vessel and there's not nutrients and there's not oxygen going to where they're supposed to go in the brain, that part of the brain starts dying. The brain is one of the most unforgiven parts of the body in which when it doesn't get its blood supply and when it does not get its nutrients and it starts dying within a few minutes and every minute that passes about 1.9 million brain cells die and when those brain cells die they become irreversibly damaged you're not getting that recovery back so that's why it's important that time is brain and uh when we say time is brain that means that every minute that passes your stroke is getting bigger. And as the stroke gets bigger, it gets, it makes it harder. It makes it harder to be able to treat that patient because then the treatment is not going to be as functional. It would not be as helpful. It wouldn't be successful. And then the patient will end up having a larger disability. Well, one of the things you mentioned, and I think it is so apropos that we talk about it in this context, um, being a municipality. Hello. You use this? You talked earlier, Doc, about your training of EMS staff. Talk about why that is so important these days. So <laughs> if we realize that time is brain, then that means that the people that will be coming in contact with that person first are very, very important. They are almost like the rate limiting steps. So what we do is we educate the community uh, not, and also educate the EMS. So it's really, really important. Before I talk on uh, EMS, it's really, really important that the family members, our community, know how to identify stroke. There's an acronym called FAST. It is very, very common. F for facial weakness. A for um, if there's any arm or leg weakness. S if the speech is slurred or different. T, time to call 911. So that family member, they're the most important step. Not myself, not the EMS, not anyone else. If they don't activate that EMS, then the person is not getting to the hospital. So, so the first thing is educate the community in fast. Then the second thing is we go out to the community and go with the EMS. We've been to uh, uh, the Merrimack EMS and we talk to them, educate them in terms of how to identify the signs of a stroke that makes us think there might be a large vessel occlusion. A stroke that if you can act within a few hours, patients can have remarkable outcomes. So we go there, we educate them usually every other month, we'll, Dr. Meta and myself will train them on the on the exam to look for. And the, you know, the fascinating thing with a memorial is once we educate them, then what happens is when that EMS gets to that facility or to that house, they, they, know, know, the to do. they know the questions to ask. Okay. And we don't we just don't stop there. Once they ask those questions and they determine, oh, this is really it looks bad, they already call us before they even get to the hospital. They call us from the field saying, Hey, there's an EMS stroke alert. We concern this, 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 they tell us all the details. And then we are already getting the cat lab ready. The ER is ready. We're already getting, every, we already activate. Everyone has to be within the, if, if it's nighttime, everyone will be in the hospital within 30 minutes. So it's a parallel workflow process, which everything is working in tandem. So that by the time the patient gets to us, we are fired up and ready to go. So, mm -hmm. so that's why that, you know, educating the community about fast is important and educating EMS in terms of how to identify certain kinds of stroke that are amenable to treatment. And then they call us from the field. So we don't even stop where, we don't stop where they call us from the field. The third thing we do is we actually give them feedback. We'll send to them the, the identified images of what the vessel looked like before and what the vessel looked like after we open it up and tell them how, how appreciative we are of their efforts. 
because without them doing what they do, we cannot do what we do. So it, it's a symbiotic relationship and it, it's an appreciative relationship where we educate them and we give them feedback. Incredible. Just to remind those who might be viewing us on Facebook Live at this moment, you may join the chat and forward your questions to us and we'll have either Dr. or, or uh, Carol answer those questions. One of the things, Carol, that we've spoken about in, the, in fact, the last session we had on radio, we talked about the fact that these are realities that are specific to, to segments of our community. But the one thing that I, I, I think, if you remember, my major takeaway the last time we chatted is that EMS and the community are being are being um, trained to understand what we're talking about. Absolutely, um, um, Winston, because that was our issue in 2009 that um, our son was taken to the closest hospital. And that's when we realized that not all hospitals are created equal. Right. That, you know, if you're having a stroke or you had a stroke and the thought process, the protocols, I should say, at that point was take the person to the closest hospital. Yes, right. That may not be the right center. So that's why part of the education that we've been educating our community about is choosing the right center, advocating. And with Dr. Mehta and his team, Dr. Ajiboye, actually educating the emergency management services, we have seen major progress because now they know to take that patient to a comprehensive stroke center, such as Memorial Regional Memorial West, where the patient can get the appropriate treatment to really get a better outcome, achieve a better outcome. Other than that, you could actually be in a facility that they cannot do any of these cutting edge treatments. Yeah, and therefore, the outcome is not good. <laughs> Therein is, is the incredible advances that, Carl, you and I have seen happen mm -hmm. over the last 10 or so years that we've been talking. Absolutely. Because, as you say, the idea is to get this patient to the nearest hospital as quickly as possible, when that might actually be counterproductive. Exactly. So educating our community about where are the comprehensive stroke centers, the Joint Commission stroke centers that can actually do all the treatment that is that may be required for that patient getting that patient to those those centers and being a voice advocating because you know you may have someone that says hey yeah let's go down to the closest hospital but you can say i want to take my loved one here if it takes an extra five minutes it's still saving a life or saving brain cells to get to the appropriate center so that is so important that we in really addition Mm -hmm. In addition, oh, and Dr. Dia Boy is, is with us again. Listen, yep. one of the incredible things that we've we've discovered, Carolyn, talking with yourself and Dr. Meta recently, is that the hospitals have now included certain modalities that doesn't didn't exist before. Exactly. Talk a little bit about that. Exactly. Norman, are you gonna answer that one or I'm sorry, what's the question? I can hear. What's the question? <laughs> the treatment modalities that now can be used. To street that just never existed recently. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So the treatment modalities up until like in the 1990s, what we used to do was mostly just certain medications called aspirin plavix. We still use that, but then you know the FDA approved back in like in the night early to mid 1990s a medication called IVTPA. That is a medication that you have to get within a certain amount of time, within 4.5 hours. That's why, you know, we always say time is brain and you also have to get the patients to us in a timely fashion. That medication has the ability to dissolve the clot, right? But all strokes are not created equal. So there are certain strokes, the ones that I usually end up having to take to the cat lab are usually large vessel occlusions and those do not respond well to TPA. So the new technique over the last five, 10 years that has revolutionized our field of neuroendovascular surgery is called a thrombectomy. With yes, that, it's sir. just like plumbing. It's like plumbing. We go, you know, just like a plumber will come in and put the rotor rotor in the in the pipe. We go in from either the leg or the arm, get into the channels of the body, the blood vessels, and get our catheters and wires deep into the vessels in the brain, and we ensnare the clot with uh, a stent retriever, and we also hook it up to an aspiration tubing and literally pull it out 
from the brain out through the leg or through the arm. So that's that's the uh, procedure that has revolutionized stroke care. The thing is this, you want to do that within a certain time. We give right. it up to 24 hours, but they're not created equal. If someone comes in at the 23rd hour and I'm doing that procedure, they probably won't do as well as someone that comes in in like the third or fourth or fifth hour, right? Because uh, the person that you're doing at 23rd hour already has a large stroke and they're likely to bleed in that area. So that procedure is quite important and the be it's, it has better outcomes if you do it earlier. Yeah. You know, let me let me just insert this here. One of the things that is evident, Carol, and I think you are this person who have found these incredible professionals. There is an enthusiasm in Dr. G. Boye as well as Dr. Meta to do the work they do. This is a really special blessing. It you, is. You can absolutely. hear the enthusiasm. It's so incredible. Thank you, and Doc. It, we are we are so blessed as an organization and as a community. To yeah. have physicians such as Dr. Meta, such as Dr. Ajibaye. I have never met Dr. Ajibaye. Okay. We actually had a telephone introduction <laughs> by way of Dr. Meta. And oh my gosh. <laughs> I call him and I then I call him and he says, Well, I said, Dr. Ajibaye, am I pronouncing your name right? Just call me Norman. You know? <laughs> so, and we had such a wonderful conversation and you know, his thinking is so in line with what is needed what in the been community. To, yes, 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 yes. I, I, I mean, I got off the phone with him and I was so impressed and I started telling everybody, everybody about him as well. But you're right. He's very passionate about what he does yeah. and the positive impact that he's made in the community. And so is Dr. Mader. So I can call at any time, day or night, and... I get a response. That's amazing. You, you really don't get that from many physicians, I must say. <laughs> you know what? If I can follow up on that, um, there's so on Mother's Day, uh, there was a news article on Channel 7 uh, that talked about the uh, a 42 year old lady that survived a stroke um, and lived to tell it uh, because of her 10 year old son. Uh, wow. You guys can like maybe Google that later it's um it's linda i mean it's it was on the news uh channel seven on mother's day about two sundays ago that story encapsulates why i'm always excited this is a lady she's 42 african-american yeah. lady she was on the phone at about nine o'clock at night and uh on the phone she started talking gibberish her arm fell to the ground and then she fell down and the 10 year old son started saying mommy mommy and realized that the mom was having a stroke and he went and called the neighbor and they activated 911. I was on call that night. She came in paralyzed. She couldn't walk. Wow. She came in on the stretcher. And then we found out that she had a large vessel occlusion in the brain at 42. Uh, she recently had a COVID infection and uh, we took out the clot uh, and she had a defect in her neck in the karate. We placed the stent and three days later, she walked out of the hospital intact. Wow, that's amazing. So, so the story was, you know, she gave her son life, and the son gave it back to her. Because if oh, the son did not gosh. act, if the son did not act quickly, she would have died from a big, massive stroke. The son mm -hmm. acted quickly. The EMS, I think it was Pembroke Pine EMS, they acted quickly and got to her. They called us while they were in her house, saying that, "Oh, this young lady is having a large stroke." I already set up the team to get the team ready. By the time she got to us, we were already getting ready. We were able to get to her quickly. We took out, took out the stroke. Literally, while she was on the table, when we were done, she was already asking, oh, what's going on? She's lifting her right side. She was doing better. That is what excites me. I mean, not every case goes wow. perfect, but right. a lot of them, more than 80% go well, and that's what makes me happy. And that's why you kind of hear that enthusiasm in my voice and also ah, in the voice of Meta, Meta as well. There you go. There you go. And what what I like about this this story as well, we're talking about a ten year old who recognized the signs were not good signs. Right. Yep. So, so that's why education is key. Anyone exactly. could, anyone could do it. Now you can be young as long as you notice something is different. Just tell a neighbor or someone or call. Just call nine one one, and let get them to the hospital pretty quickly. 
I'm sorry, Doc, but this just means more work for you and people like Dr. Beta. <laughs> it means you guys have to start coming to our schools. That's what that means. <laughs> I, I was just going to say that because yeah. that's what we do. We do that yeah. as well. We go to yeah. the community centers. We've gone to schools and we have educated young children, high school, middle school as well. So, and we need to do more of that. So we have been doing that. So small organizations can make impact. And I think we have done so through, and with doctors again, like Dr. Victor, Dr. G. Boyer, Dr. Clinton Jules, he's another one I can call at any time. He's right there with me, with us, you know, with the okay. education. Hmm? Let, us, let us talk a little bit then about pre-stroke. Talk about lifestyle problems, lifestyle challenges, and what we can do to, to better prepare ourselves for even when a stroke does come, it's not a massive one. Talk about lifestyle and the need for changes. Okay. Do you want me to start off with that? Yeah. yeah go ahead. So I know right now we've painted a picture of you know stroke being very, very bad. And it's true, it's very, very bad. But if there's any silver lining in the sky, if there's any good news I can bring, it's that. 80% of these strokes are preventable. 80% of them are preventable. And when I start talking or thinking about, you know, the, how the fact that they're preventable, I categorize them into two categories. There is the modifiable, the ones that you have control over. And then there's the unmodifiable, the ones that you have no control over. The ones you have no control over are your age. As you get older, you're likely to have more clogged pipes. So you're likely to have strokes. Uh, also, you know, Usually, males are usually at higher risk of stroke up until the age of 60. And then after that, the ladies catch up and then they become higher as they get into menopause. Uh, genetic history, if there's a family history of a first degree relative, you know, you can't choose your family. That's also um, not modifiable. But even within that 80% that's preventable, a significant portion of them are modifiable. You have control over that. So think again about that pipe that's delivering water, about the rust developing. What are the things that cause rust or plaques to develop in our blood vessels? Uh, these are things like high blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, poor diet. These are things that are common in the African-American society uh, due to the diet. So if you have high blood pressure, if you have diabetes or cholesterol, you need to make sure that you regularly see a physician and you have them, you know, take a look at your blood pressure, measure your hemoglobin A1C, and also check your LDL, which is a measure of your cholesterol, and have them treated appropriately. Things you can do to help control those are exercise. You know, the American Heart Association and Stroke Association recommends 30 minutes of moderate to intense exercise each day, usually five days a week. It doesn't have to be seven days, it's five days a week. Uh, eating a healthy diet, typically I recommend to my patients and to my loved ones, Mediterranean diet, rich in vegetables and fruits and uh, nuts and, um, you know, trying to minimize any processed food. Uh, and then also staying away from salt as much as possible. So if there's any good news here, it's 80% of strokes are preventable and a significant portion of the risk factors you have control over. Yeah, and you also mentioned, Dr. Jiboye, that um, after the age of 65, then we see that um, the incidence in women increase. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and you know, when I first started, we first started this foundation, we weren't even aware that twice as many women die from strokes than breast cancer. Uh, yeah. And that's still the same. And there's high incidence of death in the black in black women versus any other ethnic ethnic group. That's correct. Yes, you're correct. And I mean, if you want to get into the theory, they usually say it's maybe the estrogen is initially protective, and as you know, people get into menopause and there's no more estrogen, then the androgens, the other um, steroids, uh, the other hormones become higher. And what increases the risk of strokes in men 
basically outweighs the estrogen now in women, and then it's higher risk of stroke in women after menopause, especially in the African American uh, women. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I, I, I harken back to my conversations for more than 20 years with gynecologist Dr. Winston Alexis. Mm -hmm. One of the things I want Dr. Ajiboye to, to remind us is that, okay, we keep hearing about estrogen and we make the connection specifically only with women, but men carry some of that around in their bodies as well. You're right. So, yeah, men carry some of that, but it's not in a significant proportion as well right it's very it's very low and that's why before menopause uh it's higher in men because the androgens the testosterone increase your risk of stroke mm -hmm. uh and uh, so yes but you're right i think the proportion the fact that we don't have enough so if you have a gentleman that has more a significant amount of estrogen their risk of stroke theoretically might be lower okay mm. One of the things I want us to to really highlight before we um, we're actually halfway through already. This is how good this this discussion has been. Um, is is how important it is for for the public. And I, Carl, you remember me saying this, and I say to other doctors as well. One of the things that I find very painful is to see at the time of the day I go to work, um, you see people in the parks, and from a distance you can tell. This is a stroke victim, mm -hmm. and you kind of kind of want our people to do something about this before it gets to that stage. Mm -hmm. and, and I think part of part of what has happened is that, especially us who are immigrants, we come to this country and we go by the old dictum that says work hard and you'll be OK, but we're not taking care of ourselves enough. Talk a little, both of you, what kind of impact you think this has had on lifestyle? The, the whole matter of the pandemic. Are we taking better care of ourselves or are we still missing the boat? Oh, Carol, I see that. Look, we're not. <laughs> oh, I definitely think we're missing the boat. Oh. That, you know, the, the pandemic really put extra stressors on many people. The okay. stress level has increased markedly. And I think, uh, I think most people remain pretty sedentary and a lot of weight gain over that year, you know, so the pandemic did not help our situation at all. And Dr. Jiboy, I'm pretty sure that you have seen probably an increase or what have you seen in the hospitals during this pandemic so, in so, terms of stress? So I agree with you. I think the pandemic certainly exposed the disparity in health, both in terms of the disease pathology and also in the treatment. Uh, it, but also during this pandemic, you know, people have become sedentary. People, uh, and also there's also depression. There's also stresses. Doesn't help, things, right? You know, things that increase your risk of stroke because they cause what we call a catecholamine surge. You know, this chemicals in the body that can cause your vessels to spasm and get tighter. So certainly, uh, I think you know, and also during the pandemic, people were not coming into the hospital when they're having stroke symptoms. So I remember during the pandemic, we saw a lot more patients come late to the hospital already with, you know, evolved stroke that you can't do anything about. So because they were afraid. <laughs> yeah, because they were afraid of catching COVID in the hospital. Yeah. 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 So I think the, the, the biggest education is just people should try and stay healthy, work, exercise, uh, don't be sedentary. Uh, I know, you know, there's a lot of issues going on with the pandemic that affects how people make choices. Uh, but if there's anything, I think we should always value uh, human re you know, relationships and that's been hard in social isolation. So, mm -hmm. you know, if, I, things are getting better now. So hopefully people can start getting out and making sure they're putting on their mask, but also start interacting with people that will help reduce your level of stress. Uh, and also start working out or exercising and eating healthy. And let's hopefully put this pandemic behind us. Okay, both of you guys, uh, Dr. Jiboye and, and Carol, I want you to reintroduce yourself to those who might have joined us late. Go ahead and introduce yourselves. Okay, so I am the president of Smiley's Voice Foundation, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization in South Florida. And our mission is to increase our community's awareness of stroke and its impact 
um, prevention, treatment, identifying the risk factors, and our organization was founded in 2010. So um, at that point, stroke was the third leading cause of death, and now it's the fifth leading cause of death. So I can say, of course, there's been major some progress. Been. There's been yes. some progress, and, and I think that small organizations like ourselves have actually helped in terms of the educating that we have done, the education that we've done in the community with supporters like Memorial Healthcare System and their physicians, Dr. Jibo, Dr. Mater, so many that I can't even begin to tell you. The health screenings that we've done throughout the years, we do that in the different settings that I stated before, educating in the schools, the, the screenings for the risk factors, the high blood pressure, cholesterol, all free screenings that we've done throughout the year with, again, support of these health systems, Baptist Health South Memorial, Florida Medical Center. I think that we've been blessed to have such support so that we can make this impact. Also, part of our mission is to support education, and we give scholarships to nursing and um, medical students. We've done about 18 or so since our inception, uh, both in South Florida as well as in Jamaica. And uh, we also provide financial assistance to stroke victims or the survivors if they need assistance with maybe uh, insurance payment. Sometimes when the younger people have a stroke, they don't have the ability to work. So they may be at a loss for paying for the insurance premiums. We can fill that gap. We have done so. They may need equipment. They may not have coverage. We have filled that gap, you know, so these are the things that we're proud of that we have been doing in the community. When somebody can call us and say, hey, my husband is having a major headache. What should I do? Where should, where should he go? You know, when they tell us that they've come to our events and they've learned a lot, you know, it makes us feel good that we're actually living our mission. So those are some of the things that we do as Smiley's Voice Foundation. And your turn, Dr. Ajiboye, to re reintroduce yourself. Uh, I'm a neuroendovascular surgeon by training. I did my training at Thomas Jefferson in uh, Philadelphia and my advanced training at Texas Stroke Institute in Dallas, Texas. Uh, I work at the Memorial Healthcare System at Regional and West, and I help in the management of patients with uh, stroke. So all the way from medical therapy to uh, minimally invasive surgical intervention. Uh, I'm always excited to take care of patients with strokes and give them the possibility for them to have a full recovery. And um, but my work is not just restricted to just within the hospital. I also get to go out in the community and educate uh, the community in terms of how to identify stroke uh, through the FAST acronym. Uh, and uh, I also work with the EMS in terms of educating them so that they can, you know, alert us to stroke alerts right from the field and allow us to be ready just in time because uh, time is brain. Every minute that passes, about 1.9 million brain cells become damaged and they are irreversibly damaged. And once that, and that time to present into the hospital can mean the difference between complete recovery, uh, significant disability, as well as death. So I really appreciate what Carol Hilton does in terms of allowing the community to be educated. And I also appreciate Commissioner Winston for allowing me to be part of this platform uh, to communicate with you guys in Miramar. You're welcome, Dr. Ajiboy. What, one of the things I, I uh, questions I like to ask Carol, and I'm asking you because you've been in this for such a time. Have you seen a change in attitude where strokes are concerned, if only where people are more aware of it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, like I said, people call us from time to time. They're having a headache. I'm afraid I might get a stroke. I'm, I'm listening to, 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 to the education that you've, you've done over the radio or in person. So I think there's a problem. You know, what about my hemoglobin A1C? You know, I, I'm, I'm concerned because I know I'm at risk for a stroke if it's high. So I actually see people and hear people calling us and and asking advice early on when they okay. begin to show the sign. What about my blood pressure? What should I do? 
You know, I was prescribed this. Should I take it? Should I not? What about herbals? And and I think it's important. And maybe Dr. Ajiba, you want, want to um, talk about the herbals, that, that treatments that's out there that, you know, for high blood pressure. And some people try to, you know, go in the herbal way instead of the traditional way. I don't know. You know, the, you know the, there's an interaction between herbals, herbs, sometimes in the prescribed meds. I don't know if it's always a good idea. To, to take them both, or at least you should notify the physician if you're doing herbal treatments in conjunction with the prescribed meds, because a lot of our people in our community sometimes either don't want to take the prescribed meds and decide that they're going to rely 100% on herbs. I don't know what your take is on that, Dr. G. So, uh, first of all, I'll address the issue about the community being more aware of stroke. Uh, you know, I recently moved from Texas uh, to Florida, and even though certainly the incidence of stroke is higher in the community here because of the, uh, you know, South Florida and the uh, retirement communities, so we have a lot more elderly. But one thing I've noticed is that people are more aware of strokes thanks to what you guys do uh, in terms of educating them. And the way you can tell is this. A lot, we rarely see strokes in which a lot of the infarct has been completed. A lot of the strokes we see come in early. And uh, mm -hmm. so it, compared to when I was in Texas, in Texas, uh, we also had some rural areas where we had to transport patients all the way from other hospitals it's to our main hospital. But um, there we saw a lot more completed infarcts in which there's nothing we can do. Here, it's very, very rare. So certainly what you guys are doing in this community is working and just keep doing it. So I appreciate that effort. Now addressing the issue of herbs, you know, I'm not, usually what I tell patients is this, stick to the medications that have been shown to work. A lot of these trials like aspirin, Plavix, you know, TPA, thrombectomy, these are trials that we call double-blinded and randomized, meaning that people were put in one situation where they didn't get that treatment, and people were put in the other situation where they got the treatment and they found that getting that treatment, patients did much better. So it's already gone through the rigorous vetting by the FDA, by, uh, by the research committees. Those have been proven to work. So if any time you think about using herbs, certainly talk to your doctor, but herbs should not, in my mind, should not be a replacement for truly verified medications and procedures that have been shown to work. Okay, let me let me let me intercede here and, and explain if ask for more explanation, Dr. Ajiboye. We come out of these traditions that rely to a certain extent on the natural preparations. And one of the things that has been explained to me, and I've tried to share with a number of people, is that when you have a pharmaceutical product, what you have is not only something that has been through the rigorous R and R process, but something that has specific measures and balances. So what you have is a particular size, which has a particular component of whatever substances and so on is. When you come to the natural preparations, what kind of standards do you have? What kind of measurements do you have? Do you use a handful of this particular bush? Do you use a certain number of drops of this juice? And I think this is part of what we have to get home to our people that, hey, we're not saying that they're not efficacious, but how do you manage and control the dosage? And you really can. I, I think that is that is what I think we need to explain to our people who are kind of locked into into and, and it has changed over time. Yes, because so many of the large pharmaceutical companies have gone the, the natural herbal way as well, but mm -hmm. the standardization that exists in that area still hasn't caught up with the pharmaceuticals. And, and I think that is, that is 1 of the pieces of information we have to share with our community. Yes, we, we come from that tradition, but why this is not why this is different. Because I like to tell people and, and Jamaicans would understand the terminology and I'm sure it's Dr. Okay, you. When we talk about the magic that penicillin has been, <laughs> I like to tell people that um, penicillin really came from what we in Jamaica call jonjo. Mm -hmm. it's, it's from a fungus. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? so, right. so it is not far-fetched to think that a natural entity can be of benefit. 
But when you start running into problems is when you know when you don't know what kind of dosage works under what circumstance. Exactly. So I think I mean honestly the best way to do that we got to put those things in trials, right? Ah. Uh, well, which which pharmaceutical company will help with that? You know, because I mean a lot of the medications and a lot of the medications come from they've got some natural components to them, exactly. and they certainly and they also certainly have their side effects. And uh, but then the question is, as you said, how do you know how much dosing do you take? You know, what's the appropriate dosing? Uh, how do you know if you take too much and then you have you at risk of bleeding instead of it working to reduce you from having a stroke? Uh, those are things that you have to put in an, in, in a research study. Um, I'm sure people have used it and they've tried it, but we don't know is it causing some kind of damage to certain other parts of the body. So, you know, those are those are difficult questions. Um, but, you know, when you come into a situation where there's a lot of gray zone, then you got to go to something that's been tried, that's been verified, that you can trust. And those are some of these medications that we use that's been shown to reduce the risk of stroke. Mm -hmm. Which then, Doc, brings us to the matter of vaccines for the coronavirus. <laughs> What what is your advice for for your patients? So uh, for vaccinations, I certainly recommend them having the vaccines. Uh, I got the vaccine myself, the Pfizer. Uh, I know the Pfizer and the Moderna have been uh, proven to work with uh, minimal side effects. I was actually reading something. I think it was yesterday saying the AstraZeneca one increases the risk of stroke. Uh, and I know. So, and I think that's also the one that's related to increased risk of blood clots. So my recommendation is if you can just stay with Pfizer, Moderna, uh, you know, that would be my recommendation. Certainly get it, it's protective. Um, and the question then is how about in kids? And I think it's approved for kids as young as uh, 12. Oh, yeah, we've yes. heard that, yes. yeah. So yeah, it's a simple recommendation. I think go ahead and get it. Uh, the side effects are pretty minimal. Even though it seems like you know we we developed the vaccine so quickly, it's it's not that the process was rushed. I mean, it still went through the vigorous vetting process. It was just that a lot of the red tape got taken away, and enough money was made available for them to be able to do their 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 study pretty quickly. The other thing is, you know, there's still probably long term effects, like one two year out, that we don't know what those side effects are, and so those are things that we'll see. You know, as time goes by, but I think the short answer to your question is certainly I recommend it because I think it helps to protect you from COVID. COVID is not it's it's not a good thing, as you know. You know, it, COVID actually attacks the blood vessels. So if you remember okay. me talking about the pipes and then causing uh -huh. rust, COVID can actually attack the wall of the pipe and cause it to develop rust. That's why you know that forty-two year old patient that I saw, she had COVID. Uh, a lot of some of the significantly bad or significant strokes are taken care of are patients with COVID, and you can literally see clots forming. I've seen two, there's a 10 year old and an eight year old that were recently at Memorial over the last two months that came in with clots in the brain that also had COVID, the uh, MIS syndrome. So I think it's important that um, we certainly, if there's an option to help reduce your risk of COVID, like taking the vaccination, I think it should be it should be taken. Absolutely, I I think that is so needed in our community because a lot a large number of people in our community they are still hesitant to taking the the vaccine and they're still waiting for a year out or so, and you know that puts us at risk. You know, I I've developed a number of theories in this during this pandemic. People will claim, for example, that it is an experimental drug. And Doc, you don't have to agree with me. And Carol, you don't have to agree with me. But my response to that is this. All medication are ex experimental. You don't know if it's going to work. <laughs> because a medication that is tried on this patient might not be good for another patient. So exactly. in that sense, it is experimental as well. You know, and I, I want to think I have an appreciation of science. So I'm sorry, I'm going along with the scientists. Oh, absolutely. I had my vaccine. I had the Pfizer. <laughs> my entire family was vaccinated. Because we understand the risks and what COVID does. 
And what, what I'm learning here from Dr. Ajiboye is as well, is how without us even thinking of it, because we don't know, is the possible link between the whole stroke condition and, and COVID because it goes after the blood vessels. Absolutely. Absolutely. If, if we've learned nothing else today, this is one of the major takeaways that we have from, from this discussion today. That, that the, stroke, the stroke happens in the blood vessels and here comes Mr. COVID wanting to attack the blood vessels as well. Exactly. Yep. We, 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 we've done, we've covered a, a lot of really incredible ground and, and I, I want us to start reviewing some of the things we've talked because the value of doing this is not that people necessarily join us um, live. Some people join us and not comment or respond, but the value lies in the fact that we, we repeat programs like this on the um, Miramar cable channel from time to time. So its value continues even after we close in a few minutes from now. And I think that is one of the major reasons why I want to tell you both so much uh, thanks for, for spending the time um, and it's especially Dr. Ajiboye, who is actually on duty as, as we, we do this. But I also think that enhanced our, our chat this evening because here he is in the midst of an institution that's dealing with all of these things. Yeah. 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 Dr. Ajiboye, you, you want to talk about hypertension a little bit more since that's so prevalent in our community and that's the silent killer? Uh, well, actually, so hypertension is the number one modifiable risk factors. So, you know, stroke is this bad wolf that destroys lives. The silver lining is the risk factors that we can control. 80% of them are preventable. And if you want to say which one, which one should I select? As I said, hypertension is the number one. And the way I think of high blood pressure is this. Think about it. Remember that pipe? If you should increase the pressure of the water within that pipe, it can potentially rupture the pipe, right? Pressure. Or what happens right. is as, it, as, as that water goes at a high speed against the wall of the pipe, rust and plaques develop. So that's the same thing that happens with high blood pressure. You know, if your, your blood pressure is supposed to be like less than one, you know, ideally 110, 120 over 80. That's it. so every time your heart beats, that initial lob, it sends out the pressure of 110. And then when it uh, beats the second time, the pressure of 180. So if your blood pressure is consistently in the 160s or 170, as soon as it's actually per the guidelines, if it's above 130 over 90, that's high blood pressure. So if it's hitting that blood vessel wall at such a high pressure, there are two things that can happen over time. Number one, as it hits that blood vessel, that blood vessel is thickens, you know, it's the, it's the reaction of the blood vessels. It's uh -huh. like, I want to be firm yeah. so that I don't, you know, so I don't get, you know, blown out. It, it, it thickens. And as that blood vessel thickens, then that reduces the blood that's going to the brain that's supposed to supply nutrients and oxygen. So that's why it's important to have that blood pressure below, ideally around 110, 120 over 80. So if there's any way you can reduce your blood pressure, it's really important to do that. The beauty of exercise is this exercise trains the heart to become more efficient. And when the heart becomes more efficient over time, the heart doesn't work, doesn't have to work as hard and that would lower your blood pressure as well. If exercise doesn't do that, then you have to take medications and make sure you're compliant. You take your medications that you're supposed to. The other thing also is this, uh, you know, if let's say you're taking, uh, food that's rich in cholesterol or fatty foods. So in addition to the blood pressure, that high blood pressure beating against the wall of the vessel, making it thick, you're also having the, the plaques from cholesterol. And if you have diabetes, you know, the sugar also all sticking to the wall, just progressively narrowing your blood vessel and reducing the important nutrients and oxygen to the brain. So hypertension is key and the key is to reduce it. Exercise, diet and uh, certainly taking the medications as prescribed by your doctor. Mm -hmm. well, one of the challenges that our community and similar communities have had over time is that we ate in a different fashion where we came from. Um, mm -hmm. 
I remember specialists explaining to me, for example, that a lot of us were never in the habit of eating these big chunks of meat. <laughs> Here we come in relative terms, the, the meat is cheap, so we've dived into it. Are we, are we talking here, Doc, and, and this is just speculation on my part, are we talking here about our systems, for example, being more used to a vegetable food oriented diet, having to now cope with meat? That, does that create challenges for our bodies? Um, that, I mean, that could be true. I mean, I grew up in Nigeria and uh, in Nigeria where I grew up, we had a farm. We had a lot of things from the ground. Uh, so I think also, I mean, a big part of it, I think our body are created to be more of those kind of eat from the ground as opposed to less of this processed, you know, processed food. They're not good for the body at all. And, mm -hmm. you know, they're usually the things that are cheaper. Uh, and they're, they're convenient. What's that? <laughs> Cheap <convenient>. and convenient. <laughs> Whereas the healthy stuff, like it's the ground, are the ones that are expensive. And that's what we need. That's what uh, is healthy for us. Right. So I think, about, I mean, I don't think it's just unique to just us. I think in general, mm -hmm. you know, if you look back at the ancestors, uh, the original people, you know, way back, you know, uh, centuries ago, they used to be hunter, hunters and gatherers, mostly, uh, you know, natural things. And uh, over time, we kind of evolved to eating more animals and then over time to eating processed those processed food are the worst than the animals. Plant based is always ideal if you can. What what one of the one of the silver linings that has come out of the pandemic for me on a very personal, although public level, is the fact that contributions of food continue to be made to communities. And when mm -hmm. I get off this um, chat, I'm going to actually deliver food to two separate addresses. No, really three separate addresses. And what is, I've seen happening, and my wife takes care of that whole collection and distribution through our church and so on. And one of the things I have noticed is the amount of vegetables that are offered by these different agencies and associations that are gifting to, to members of the community. And I want to hope that this is also a good sign of what is to come for our community because we've been, that we've been eating more of this kind of, of food. Mm -hmm. So, yes. so if 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 if, if uh, the pandemic has caused anything else, I am thinking the fact that there's so much food that people are not actually paying out of their pockets for. Mm -hmm. People are beginning yeah. to get creative and adventurous in preparing some of these meals that have come to us, and not a lot of it is meat. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I've seen that. So listen, before before we run out of time, I just want you guys to repeat what I consider the major um, takeaways for, from this little chat. Dr. Ajiboye, um, talk if you would. I, I like the technical, the, the technological side of it. Talk about the, um, the process where you're actually going into someone's blood vessels and knocking that stroke <laughs> away. Talk about that for a minute. <laughs> you want me to talk about the technical part? I, I'm I'm forgetting the, the, the particular um terminology that is used to it. The from back to me. From from back to me is right. Yes. You want the technical part? Oh, just just tell us the fact that that exists and it never existed once and how helpful it is. Oh, okay, okay. So yes, yeah, so the thing is that um you know the most important thing is time is brain. Get to the hospital fast because any treatment that you need to get. You want to get it in a timely fashion so that it can actually work to further reduce any more brain damage. Um, up on, back in the 1990s, we developed a medication called IVTPA, which is a clot busting medication that works for small strokes. It doesn't work for strokes that are in large vessels because those cannot be lysed. So what we need is something called a thrombectomy. You can basically get into that vessel in the brain from the vessel in the leg or the vessel in the hand, you get there by catheters and wires and basically like a plumber, you know, the plumber comes in, they have the rotor, rotor, they, pu they put it in the, in the pipe. We do the same thing. We just get our catheter and what we call a stent retriever. We get them all through the leg, all through the uh, abdomen, all through the heart and then all the way up through the neck and then into the brain and we park it where we see the clot 
and we try and snatch the clot and pull it all the way down. And then once that's pulled out, we then do another run. And a lot of times, usually more than 90% of the time, the blood vessels are open. That is called a thrombectomy. And that has to be done within 24 hours because the further you wait before doing that, the less likelihood that that's going to work. The clot is already hardened. It's hard to pull it out or you already have a big stroke and opening it out can just cause it to bleed into that stroke. So that is what we call the thrombectomy. If there's any three, if there are three things that I want the audience to learn from today's, uh, you know, communication are number one, know how to identify a stroke fast, face your weakness, arm weakness, speech difficulty, time to call 911. Time is brain. Every minute that passes 1.9 million brain cells die. Number two, stroke is a bad thing, but guess what? The silver lining, 80% are preventable. And one of those things that's preventable is high blood pressure. And how can you prevent it? Exercise, eat healthy, visit your doctor and take your medications. And then number three, COVID can increase your risk of stroke because it attacks the blood vessels. So make sure you go out there and take your vaccination if it's offered. <laughs> I, I don't thank know. Thank you. No, I thank you, Dad. Thank you so much. And no, thank you for comments. giving me the opportunity. You're most <laughs> welcome. You. Thank you so much, <laughs> Winston. Your final comments, Carol, quickly. Well, my again, uh, thanks to Dr. Jiboye and uh, Memorial Healthcare System for the support that they've given to us throughout the years. And we just could not do it without them. My family, our board members, the community in a whole, the financial support that they have, you know, donated to us so that we can continue to do this mission. And Smiley's Voice Foundation will be heard near and far, making a difference in the lives of many through stroke awareness and education program, impacting lives in a positive way, one person at a time. Listen, I, 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 there's no way I can say enough thanks to both mm -hmm. of you, Dr. Norman Ajiboye and um, Specialist Nurse Carol Hilton. I thank you so much for making this contribution um, to this uh, engagement on Facebook Live this evening. And as I said, the great value that we, we I am convinced resides in this kind of presentation is that it gets repeated on our um, cable channel. So the information will be relayed to different audiences at different times. I thank you so much. And I also thank um, our staff at the city of Miramar. Um, thanks to our producer, director, manager, um, agitator, <laughs> <laughs> Lorna, Lorna, um, and, and um, for, for making this possible and, and making it possible the way it, it takes place every time. I thank you guys so much. And I hope our residents, our audience, our viewers, our watchers, I've learned something special this evening as we um, help to contribute to Stroke Awareness Month 2021. I thank you all for participating. You're more than welcome. Thank you. And thank you, Commissioner Barnes, and thank you, Carol Hilton. We <laughs> truly, truly appreciate all you do. Dr. Meadows spoke highly of you, Ms. Carol Hilton, <laughs> and how you're raising stroke awareness. Yeah. I know what happened to your son was tragic, but you were able to use that to save a lot of other countless lives. And that is truly, truly appreciated. We cannot do what we do without you guys, without the, the community being educated. So thank, thank you. you. Thank There's you. a lot of blessings in there. Thank you. We are blessed. Thank you. <laughs> okay, have a good evening. Thank you so much, Carol. And thanks a million again, everyone who was involved in our presentation today and who made it possible. Okay. Bye-bye.